Welcome to the IdeaGen Global Partnership Summit live here in New York City on the sidelines of UNGA and Climate Week. We're honored to be here today with the American Psychiatric Association Foundation Dream Team, <laughs> including Angela Jones, Dr. Raul Andrews Jr., and Amy Porfiri. A heartfelt welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. And here we are on the sidelines of UNGA, UNGA having been an annual event here in New York City with global leaders, this year talking about the Pact for the Future, the prelude to the next global goals. And we're hopeful that that will look good. And your voice and your perspectives are going to be critical in this journey because I know the American Psychiatric Association Foundation is focused on helping to impact and affect the scourge that is mental health today, the problems surrounding it, especially for the future generations. And so I'd like to ask each of you, what previous experiences have helped to, helped really you arrive where you are today at the association? All right, well, I'll start. Um, so I had a career in corporate America, for-profit settings, um, and at the beginning of last year, I decided to retire. I raised four kids, I worked for more than 30 years, and um, I saw this opportunity at the foundation. And my undergrad is in psychology, and I thought, wow, what an opportunity to give back, take some of my business skills, bring them to a foundation, um, and help make impact and change the world and make it better for my children and for others. Um, I found myself during the pandemic managing a team of 50 people woefully unprepared for the mental health issues that my team was going through in the workplace. Our culture there didn't have the support systems needed for our you know, managers of people and, and executive leaders. Um, I, you know, I had mothers who were trying to raise children and they were trying to work and teach their children. So many different issues. And then just seeing my young kids go through the pandemic. And so I felt like it was my time to get off the sideline and get in the game and, and try to make a change. So that's what really spurred me. Incredible, inspiring Amy. Yeah, I'm, you know, I've always worked in the area of medical research and, and science and the administrative aspect of it. And I've been at American Psychiatric Association for over 20 years. So I've spent quite a bit of my career there, but more so on, in the division of research through the development of their diagnostic manual called the DSM-5. Um, and that's manual for our practitioners. But you know, over time, I really saw this issue of, of really tackling the mental health problem of, of you know, over 20 years, we're still dealing with the same problems that we were dealing with 20 years ago without a lot of change, without an increase of services and supports mm -hmm. and accessibility for, for so many people. So I was able to transition over to the foundation, which allows me to really work much more at the community level and uh, really how can we affect change? How can we really work to improve access to care, affordability of mental health care, and to destigmatize uh, mental health care treatment? Incredible. George, okay. I have always been an advocate. And while it's only been three years at the APA Foundation, you know, for 15 years uh, before the APA Foundation, I was at AARP. And we were doing NGO work at scale for older adults uh, and their family caregivers. Always advocacy. For 16 years before I got to AARP, I was in the private practice of law representing industries, uh, OEMs, as well as tier ones to OEMs. Still advocacy. But it was interesting because I love this question. Because about three weeks ago, I went home for a 40 plus year high school anniversary and I got to meet the student body president who had the job I had in the early 80s. And so it was a really interesting coalition. I said, you know, it's interesting. I pretty much have had the same job since 1981, 82 that I have today, just a different badge, a different jersey, a different role. But one of the things I saw coming into and out of the pandemic was an acute focus on brain health, our dementias, Alzheimer's and so forth, but not really an acute focus on mental health. And so there was a clash uh, internally as well as within my own construct. And I was trying to figure out that I think is the grand challenge to put the body back together 
that it's mind, body, brain, and soul that has to be united for us to live whole and well. And so the foundation was my opportunity to try to do that. You know, that's incredible. To hear from the, each of you and your journeys is just profound. And I think it provides the global audience and the folks here in the room today with a perspective that maybe they didn't have uh, coming into this conversation. I'd like to ask, there are so many projects. There's so much happening. I, I can't keep up. There's so much going on at the APAF and at the APA. What are some key projects you'd like to highlight for our global audience today on the sidelines of ONGA and Climate Week? So the foundation has key pillars where our programs reside. You know, our, our vision is a mentally healthy nation for all, where you live, learn, work, worship, and play. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, the worship space. You know, 60% of Americans, uh, we, we just fielded a poll a couple of weeks ago about this issue of mental health and faith. And 60% of Americans that were polled uh, felt like uh, their religion was a, a source of support and, and well-being for them. Though only 52% of those people that are engaged in a faith community felt that there were any open conversations about mental health. Um, through the foundation's mental health and faith community partnership, we try to address that matter of open, having conversations about mental health. Most people, 68% of people in that poll, would seek mental health um, supports if their faith leader recommended it or led them to it. Um, so we've created a guide for faith leaders called Mental Health, a guide for faith leaders, that is a free resource on our website um, that really educates faith leaders within um, in faith communities or, or sort of other people who work in the faith communities, really how to have those conversations about mental health, how to understand mental health. Um, our faith leaders are oftentimes first responders for individuals and families that are experiencing mental health concern or crisis or grief. Um, and that may be where you live, that may be what's accessible to you, um, or it may be what's affordable, or it's where you're feeling most comfortable to open up and have those conversations. Um, our faith leaders, what we've learned through our partnership is often feel very ill-equipped. Mm -hmm. They don't receive a lot of training in their vocational practice on how to have those Right. conversations, how to have an understanding, and really what is their role as a faith leader um, as opposed to a clinician. Right. So we do try to educate our faith leaders on really what that role is, how to make that connection to care, um, how to provide um, supportive communities. There's a lot they can do within their faith community through yeah. peer support, through walking with people in right. their mental health journey. Um, so this is an area where we see a lot of potential to increase our work because they really are just so instrumental in people's lives. Um, so that's, um, and Angela's going to speak a little bit about another pillar that we're, we're expanding in the foundation. But I just wanted to say that's about the connecting of the dots that you all do so well. I mean, identifying the opportunities to change the world. It's not easy to do but you have a clear vision on where you want to go. Well, George, as I've said in many conversations with you offline, the one thing you recognize when you get these moments of privilege, dots don't know their dots. <laughs> and we sit around in our silos of excellence trying to figure out how come the dots won't connect? <laughs> well, if the dots don't know their dots, how would they know their other dots and why would they ever connect? We have to be a force multiplier to leverage those opportunities. So sometimes that's foundation as a convener. In many instances, that's the foundation uh, as a thought leader. But it also, uh, when you talk about goal 17, it's the foundation as a micro philanthropist because sometimes there's great work happening on the ground and but for our international platform. You know, the APA that is our parent has been around for 180 years. So we know a lot about pandemics. We know a lot about global strife, famine, upheaval, world wars, uh, and we're actually two years older in our parent company than the American Medical Association. Most people don't know that, but on a week like this where we're tr struggling with where to go from here, is our current way of life, humanity sustainable? All of those stories are psychological. All of those stories are emotional. And if we don't get it right upstairs, we're not going to be kind to our own minds, 
And our inability to be kind to our own minds makes it impossible to be kind to others. And if we don't find that spirit of harmony, collaboration is impossible. Incredible. Yeah, yeah another uh, key initiative for us in the foundation is our lifestyle campaign. So when you think about your health, it's not just your mental health, it's your physical health and the integration of those two. We've all heard about the vagus nerve that talks from your stomach to your, your brain and that communication and that cycle. And so we're launching a campaign because we want to educate not just the entire medical community, but everyone in the U.S. about these lifestyle choices that we make every day. And many of us know what those are, what we should be doing, but there's barriers to getting there. And I'm talking about elements like, um, you know, reducing stress, uh, better nutrition, uh, regular exercise, um, you know, restorative sleep, avoiding harmful substances, all of these things that we know we're supposed to do, but don't quite get there. Um, and so launching this campaign to make sure that, that people know, especially in underserved communities where the education may not be there, starting with children so that they start a healthy lifestyle and continue that journey through their life. We know that um, these healthy lifestyle choices can also prevent mental illness, as well as um, helping people who may have serious mental illness have a better outcome um, by focusing in on these, these lifestyle pillars. Um, so that's, that's really a key um, initiative for us. We're threading that through all of our programming for our um, resident trainees, um, fellowship program, and also our medical ambassadors so that they can take that information back into their practices and into the communities where they serve. And we'll also be threading it through all of our um, signature initiatives um, and back to our mission of creating a mentally healthy nation where we live, learn, work, worship, and play. That's such a great compilation to hear from you all. Raul, I'd like to ask you, how do all of these projects then help diverse communities to thrive in all the areas that you alluded to? So when we came to our first Global Goals Summit at IdeaGen, it was our privilege to announce our Mental Health Care Works campaign. This was a campaign launched last year around awareness, literacy, and action. And so one of the reasons we launched the campaign is because our pillars, while very impactful, were only really impactful at a local level. And we wanted to be impactful at a national or a global level. So in a year's time, the Mental Health Care Works campaign, mentalhealthcareworks.org, has achieved over 435 million impressions. That's paid media, earned media, social media, and own media channels. Uh, and so what we've tried to do, and really I've challenged myself personally, to be where the action is, to move uh, into communities uh, in greater Boston, uh, in Houston, uh, to look at work that we're gonna be doing in uh, South Central Los Angeles uh, later this year and earlier into uh, next year, so that uh, awareness is high. In the history of humankind, Awareness about mental health has never been this high. It's never been this visible. It's never been this vocal. But what we didn't realize, George, is that every time we hear a story, every time we tell a story, or every time we reflect on a story about the human condition, that's a mental health story. And so we're trying to communicate to audiences. I think Faith, for example, uh, we were at HHS and the White House last week uh, with all of the major African-American churches. Uh, and temples and asking them to stop saying I'm too blessed to be stressed and here's the faith guide that's going to help you. Uh, later uh, in October uh, for Hispanic uh, Heritage Month, we're going to be bringing in all of the major CEOs and CXOs of our Hispanic and Latino organizations into APA headquarters to talk about the unique challenges uh, of the Latin X community is having around mental health. Uh, and sometimes those are the hardest to crack. But I think the, the genius of what we've tried to do, George, and Angela alluded to this, we host the largest vanguard program for psych resident trainees in the world. 46 states across the United States and 42 countries around the world. We've got 205 trainees who are, in most respects, multiple languages spoken. 
uh, multiple dialects spoken, multiple ethnicities across the world, and we're giving them a little bit of a taste of what active practice will be like, where they can provide that service at home. So they're not just doing something in Washington, D.C. They're doing it locally, but they're getting an international touch. The other thing we've done uh, is we've created this ambassador scholarship program for medical students. So now we've got over 600 medical students who've been added, again, across multiple countries and almost every state in the union. Now what people can do is get a relatable doctor a relatable physician psychiatrist who grew up where they grew up, who went to school where they went to school, who when they do their medical histories, they ate like they ate coming up. Now we're gonna change some of that with our lifestyle campaign about eating better. Uh, I've lost 10 pounds since we launched the campaign. And by the time we do my next global whatever, I'll probably look like you, George, but... Uh, <laughs> but these are the ways that we're trying to make it so that doctors don't talk past their patients and the family caregivers because you talked a little earlier about trust. And if the doctor thinks they're so much smarter than I am that they won't take the time to help me understand my situation, understand my family condition, how am I gonna get on the road to recovery? How am I gonna get healing? And if I don't have that road to recovery and healing, hope is impossible. Incredible. You know, when you just think about the, all the aspects you just wrapped up into that summation it's just profound and to think about for example faith leaders uh and and you providing them with the roadmap it's not you're not just saying mental health care works you're saying here's the tool that can help you to help others that's leadership that's impact and speaking of that amy so you collaborate you all do a really good job on collaboration what are some examples of collaboration that has helped to deliver just like the faith community? Sure. Um, you know, we're all just said hope and Hope Center Harlem is a mm -hmm. community organization. It's actually a church affiliated mental health clinic. It's affiliated with the First Corinthians Baptist Church in Harlem, a historic African-American uh, church. And they actually formed a connect. They, they saw the need. The pastor actually sp spoke from the pulpit about his mental health mm. experience and as a result they found the need to really serve the community they built a church affiliated mental health clinic that's actually attached to the church so there they provide free support uh free counseling services wow. um for community members involved in the church so there's that direct handoff you know to care um, and we support them um you know in a number of ways uh one of their, their medical director is an APA member, and um, they participate in one of our fellowship programs. So a resident from Mount Sinai was doing field service at Oak Center Harlem. So she got ex real time, you know, clinical experience, but also was able to provide needed services to the, okay. um, you know, medical services to the clinic. Um, we also sponsor, you know, health fairs. They do wow. a lot in bringing in athletes and entertainers. Um, to really, uh, you know, because this is all, you know, part of lifestyle sure. and these are the people that we listen to, especially right. bringing in the youth voices, the artists, the entertainers, to talk about being, being healthy mind, body, and spirit. Um, as another organization we work with in Alexandria, Virginia, is called the Concerned Citizens of Alexandria and in Georgia. I know you're familiar with them. And this is really where we see community at its best, where a lot of the community services, the sheriff's office, the behavioral health services, the social services, the schools, the superintendent of schools, they're all working together, they're all connected and sharing information and providing forums to come together on how they can better the community. So this is sort of our local, um, you know, we're based in Washington DC, so this is one of our local partners to really um, you know, provide some mental health expertise so that they can, you know, further their work. Um, and lastly, uh, the pipeline. So we want, uh, we work with HOSA, a Health Occupation Students of America, um, and we were, um, uh, we have an agreement with them where we do presenting and sponsorship of some of their programs because we know that early in the pipeline, we want to reach our kids yeah. earlier in the pipeline that are interested in the health professions 
you know, maybe it's not necessarily going to be psychiatry or, or something related to mental health, but if you're a cardiologist, if you're any orthopedic, you know, you're going to be dealing with mental health issues in your practice. So we had a wonderful experience at the HOSA National Conference a few months ago, uh, and these young people were just so energetic and so interested and multifaceted. So it's, it's really great for us to be further down the pipeline to see, you know, whatever we can provide in terms of mentorship or, or leadership to, to the younger generation. And what incredible examples. You went local, global, national, regional. <laughs> I'm familiar with the Concerned Citizens of Alexandria. I mean, what an incredible organization. And these are, by the way, programs that can be replicated and that you're highlighting. You're, you know, there's no one program and no one community that this all fits for, but you can take pick and choose to help impact and affect what we talked about and what we heard about earlier in a conversation, which is it's appalling. It's appalling for the record to think that if you're born in a certain zip code or if you just live three miles in that direction or that direction, that your life expectancy will be dramatically different than someone right here. That's just wrong. And a lot of what you're doing is breaking down these silos and breaking down these barriers to change the world for the better, to bring organizations together to change the world. And I encourage all of our listeners and viewers to go to mentalhealthcareworks.org because it's just profound the work that you're doing. Raul, I'd like to ask you, looking ahead, we're looking ahead, we, we've, we've heard, we've seen what you're doing, but now we're looking ahead. What are the big audacious goals for the APAF? And I know they're audacious because otherwise they wouldn't be goals, especially your goals. What are those goals? So ultimately, a society is only as just as it is healthy. And we believe there is no health without mental health. And too often, there is a rush to criminalize those who are ill. So I think the big audacious goal for the APA Foundation is to take the campaign uh, and some of the assets associated with the campaign uh, to really confront head on serious mental illness, schizophrenia, uh, bipolar, uh, and major depressive disorders. And so we've got some uh, items in the hopper that we're looking at. Uh, and the best place to get that information uh, really is to go to our website, which you already gave, mentalhealthcareworks.org. That can get you to all our portals. Uh, but here's where you can really get to know us a little better. So May of every year is National Mental Health Awareness Month. We'll be in Los Angeles the middle of May next year. On Monday, May 19th, we have our benefit. We have now signed a deal, and I'm making the announcement publicly here uh, during this summit. We are going to take over the Grammy Museum on the evening of Monday, May 19. We have the run of the whole place all evening. Uh, Angela is leading on point, uh, our staging there. But we have all four floors. People will be able to tour the facility. Uh, but you'll get a chance to meet our doctors and our trainees in a little more intimate setting. The who's who in mental health are going to be at the Grammy Museum on Monday, May 19th in Los Angeles. Uh, so I invite you all to learn more, get in touch with Angela or Amy, get you the information you need. George, I know you were uh, at our benefit this year oh, when we incredible. were at Cipriani here yeah. in the city. Cipriani. Tell me about that for your audience. How did well, you do it? it, it was a <laughs> <laughs> for the global audience, it was incredible, and I implore everyone, if you're not familiar with this benefit, to go to mentalhealthcareworks.org navigate to the site and be in Los Angeles next year. It's a profound experience to meet these professionals that are helping so many millions of people across the nation and across the world. I mean, it's just profound. And when you have these conversations, you quickly realize the impact. It's, a, it's an amazing benefit. But to me, what the takeaway was the people that you convened at the benefit. It was staggering and just left me with this just I came away inspired, and I am an optimist, but I came away even more optimistic about the future because of your work. I'll just say that. And so Roll and Amy, the role of philanthropy, 
There's some role in philanthropy and equity, private equity, parity access. What, what do you see? What is the link here to all of that? Let me give that to Angela because she really does help center us around what better role or unique role philanthropy could play. So Angela, right, right, Angela. we'll kick it to you. you. You've got this one. Okay, terrific. So philanthropy is very important in the mental health space. Um, we know that through surveys that 90% of Americans believe we have a mental health crisis. So it's no secret. We all know that here in this room. Um, Lancet Psychiatry did a study and said that across the globe, um, half of the population will have a diagnosable mental health disorder by the age of 75. So this is a big global issue. Um, we also know that philanthropy is not spending a lot in the mental health space. It's, it's just over 1% of foundations are spending. So we need to encourage more spend in this place, because, in this space, because it is a huge societal and global issue. Um, we also know that philanthropy can play a very strategic role in filling you know, unfun unfunded gaps and spurring innovation and creativity in this space. So it's, it's incredibly important. Um, you know, those who want to get involved in it more, we ask them to reach out to us because we really do. I hope you've seen we're doing great work. We're trying to make a huge difference here in the U.S. and globally. And it's a, just an incredible opportunity for people to get involved in this cause because it's, it's here to stay. It's, it's here to stay. It's not going away. And it's not going away. Yeah, unfortunately. And as we always like to ask in closing, you're global leaders. You're changing the world, each and every one of you. What advice do you have based on what you know and what you work on every single day for future global leaders? Amy? Angela? Uh, Yep, I would say just from my background, having worked in the corporate space, take care of your people. Your people are your greatest asset. They drive your bottom line. If you don't have a healthy culture, get involved, change it. We have all kinds of resources that we can provide you tools. Um, we have a Notice Talk Act in the workplace um, that helps train managers and leaders on how to approach their staff if they see someone who's challenged or struggling how to talk to them, not as a therapist, just as a leader, and then to connect them with the appropriate care so that they can get the help they need and come back and be productive. So I see that just from my experience having worked in corporate America, that that is uh, something I think that we're doing that is incredible. Yeah, and you know, another area, you know, our kids, we know how much our kids are, are dealing with mental health issues. Um, it's just been, you know, COVID-19 has just been such a challenge and the aftermath is, you know, we're still, our kids especially are still recovering from it. Um, school is just a different place and our teachers have so many challenges now, not only teaching, but also just the impact of, of this pandemic. Um, Providing, you know, mental health education to our school personnel is really um, key because they, they too are the ones that are going to notice students that are experiencing challenges that are off their baseline behavior that are coming into school a little differently. Foundi the APA Foundation has a school-based mental health program called Notice Talk Act at School where we train school personnel to really notice uh, have a better understanding how mental health may present itself in the school, how to have those conversations. Really, that's such a tough part, you know, uh -huh. to destigmatize de those conversations and really how to make that referral within the school system. Every school system, every school has a diff different services and supports for mental health. So really knowing what are those in your school system so that you can better support our kids. Well, tell me how you spend your time and with whom you spend it and your money, and I'll tell you what your priorities are. Period. Full stop. I'm not often speechless, but I love that. <laughs> <laughs> MentalHealthCareWorks.org, the APAF, three leaders here changing the world for real. Thank you so very much. <laughs>